encouraging producers to really focus on those bulls they're developing when they're bull calves, making sure that there's adequate nutrition for them, considering putting creep feed out there, but feeding a bull kind of a, making it a long-term type of project rather than a short-term push. Hi, welcome to the Beef Podcast. I'm Brad White, one of your hosts, and we're happy to have a great episode lined up today. So we've got Dr. Colin Palmer with us, and we're going to talk about all things repro and probably even focus in on the male side. So welcome, Colin. Thank you. Uh, very pleased to be here today, Brad. So we're glad to have you here uh, with us. But tell, tell us a little bit about you and kind of your background. Well, Brad, uh, in the, before we hit the record button here, you learned a little bit about me, so uh, I may as well share that. I'm originally from Eastern Canada, uh, from a little tiny beef farm in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. About 30 years ago, I moved here to Saskatchewan to uh, learn more about reproduction here at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, and I was uh, pleased to be under the, the uh, supervision of Dr. Albert Barth for my master's and and residency, and Albert was a was and still is a well known bull uh, repro expert, um, and so that was a wonderful start for me in my career. And uh, I, uh, after that, I practiced here in Western Canada, and then uh, had the opportunity to come back here to the vet college as a faculty member. Been here for uh, about twenty years, and uh, really enjoy teaching. And uh, now it's kind of settled back into uh, becoming a, a pretty good bull expert myself, or at least trying. So. Your cattle are constantly threatened by the exposure of mycotoxins in feed. Now you can know if mycotoxins are present in your feed and what you should do about it. DSM Firminish offers a range of analytical services to assess the mycotoxin contaminations and solutions to combat those mycotoxins. Don't let mycotoxins contaminate your performance. Visit dsm.com forward slash ANH dash NA to learn more. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of, your college has a history. You mentioned Dr. Barth, but but really some of the leaders in evaluating bulls, evaluating bull fertility, been really critical, especially as we look at the advent of, well, AI has been around a while, but the advent of some of our new collection methods, how we manage those bull studs, all of those things, really critical information has come out. You've done a lot of great research in that area. Before we dive into your research, you mentioned some of your teaching and you do some teaching there at the veterinary school. What's your, what's your favorite thing to teach and why? No, that's a good question. Um, my favorite thing to teach is bull fertility. Um, and, you know, you kind of touched on why it is. It, it's that long history. Um, you know, last year I, I noticed I asked for comments on my lectures and, and students said, you know, some of your references are a bit old. And so I looked at them and, you know, of course, some of them are, uh, you know, Lunster from the 80s and uh, some of the work that I did with Al Barth in the 90s, you know, like alternatives to electro ejaculation, we continued that for a while. And uh, of course, these students out there in their early 20s, uh, so, so they weren't even born when we were doing that. But, you know, I just quickly pointed out, I said, you know, the, the whole history of bull breeding soundness evaluation really goes back. It kind of starts in about the 1950s. You know, there was work done in the 60s, 70s. You mentioned uh, kind of a long history here. Bill Cates, he's, he's still alive. Um, you know, in these late 90s, Bill Cates did a pile of work here in, in, in Western Canada about getting people to do breeding soundness evaluations, kind of some, uh, you know, nowadays, not we would, we would think the statistics were a bit crude, but certainly he gave us some perspective as to, you know, what scrotal circumference measurements were for two-year-old bulls, uh, information about bulls with small scrotal circumferences, not, you know, never catching up and passing. So that's, that's a, been a great uh, legacy for me to kind of pick up with and continue on and then share with students. And it's really exciting. I have, you'd just be amazed, Brad, at the amount of slides of material because I've inherited all that material from Al Barth and, and Bill. Um, and uh, so I have piles and piles of slides that I can go back to. And, and it's it's really quite wonderful to share that. You probably even got some of the old two by twos as you go back to those. Everything's yeah. powerful. Yeah, you can yeah. see this black filing cabinet behind me. Yeah. Um, I think there is a whole tray and a half in there uh, that's dedicated to two by two slides. And I just moved them into this room here last year and, and I looked at them and, and uh, I've let the uh, the guys that are retired know. I said, you know, I, I want to maintain our history. So 
the other thing that I've got, Brad, is uh, I've got a collection of electro ejaculators, and uh, I got a group of technicians that want us to throw them out, and I won't let them. We've got they call them museum pieces. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Not everybody has that, and I think. Uh, some of those, if they thought your references were old, if you if you went and asked where the two by two projector was, they they might uh, <laughs> it might not work in school today. It wouldn't, but probably wouldn't. Yeah, the students wouldn't like that very much at all. <laughs> so yeah. so let's talk. Uh, and and I I like working on the bull side too. But you're right. You look at the amount of research that's done on cows, cow fertility, female fertility synchronization programs, all that sort of thing. And, and sometimes the bull is an afterthought. And if we give it thoughts, we think about EPDs or selections or some of those type of things. But let's really talk about bull fertility. And I'm going to start uh, kind of at the beginning and maybe get your thoughts on bull development. So as I'm coming from weaning to going to pass that first BSE, tell me what are some of your thoughts and what have, what have you learned about that process? Well, some of the really cool stuff was was work that was done here again at this college in the late 90s. Alex Evans, uh, Ramesh Chandolia, they were looking at bulls like a, um, they were looking at uh, GNRH, FSH, LH in these bulls. And they started looking at really young bulls. Um, and they discovered that b between basically two and four months of age, bulls that that um, have they have a surge in um, luteinizing hormone. They actually have a surge in GnRH, causes the release of luteinizing hormone as well as follicle stimulating hormone. And that was kind of an interesting kind of surge. And then they did it again just when they hit puberty. And what they discovered was those bulls, the bulls that had the higher rise between two and four months of age, actually reached puberty sooner than the bulls that had a lower rise in that. And then they also did some work where they actually blocked the GnRH. And then they found they delayed the onset of puberty in those bulls. And I find that really interesting. And I, I just finished lecturing to undergraduate students last week. And I talked to them about, you know, lots of our purebred producers, you know, scroll circumference means that they want to get those bulls developed. There's a tendency to kind of maybe forget about them while they're on the cow, wean those calves, and then really want to push them in a kind of a feedlot style type of format. Um, and what happens there is the data that's out there is kind of mixed. There was one paper that said you could kind of increase scrotal circumference by feeding those bulls to a, at a higher energy level. Others where it says, you know, you just increase testicular fat, um, that sort of thing. And so um, the other problems that you have with pushing young bulls like that is that you get problems with OCD, you know, so, so joint lesions, you can get liver abscesses. And then, of course, uh, we've also done some work here on seminal vesiculitis. Um, and so we never really found, you know, kind of pinpoint causes, but certainly it pointed in the direction of feeding style and kind of digressing a little bit into that is that, you know, I, I've kind of followed up with herds, herds that have quite a high incidence of, of seminal vesiculitis and yearling bulls. I'd often start talking to them about feed and, you know, whether they were the, their feeding style, where they self feeding some, some producers like to do that, where there's kind of a feed crib there. Um, that sort of thing. And then, you know, whether they were feeding Romensin or not. So, you know, Brad, one of the cool things is I, I also have a herd of cattle myself. And so I play around with little things. It's not really, many of them are controlled experiments, but sometimes I'll try little things and see how they work. And so kind of coming back to, to the original point of the question is really talking to students about encouraging producers to really focus on those bulls they're developing when they're bull calves making sure that there's adequate nutrition for them, considering putting creep feed out there, but feeding a bull kind of a, making it a long-term type of project rather than a short-term push, you know, targeting gains that are, you know, 2.5 to 3.5 pounds per day rather than pushing them for four plus pounds a day type of thing, kind of a nice, slow, steady gain, making sure there's adequate, uh, you know, fiber in the diet and, and, and that sort of thing is what, what I really encourage. The challenge is, and, and, and what I hear, people developing bulls for sale, they want them to go to that sale and be able to write down, he gained four plus pounds a day when he was on test. And when he goes through the sale ring, they want him to look fleshy. Right. He needs to he needs to look like he's ready to go, even though he, he may be really fleshy. How do you because that doesn't that is a little bit different than what you're describing, the slow, steady approach to get him there by breeding. 
how, how do you counteract some of those discussion points? Yeah, that's a good one. You know, one of the things is, that's cool that I can share with the students, I followed the industry over my entire career here, right? And I was ta- actually, that, that question came up. Um, and we used to have a lot of bull test centers in Canada here where it was, you know, rate of gain was the most important thing. What we do see now, we see less of that. Um, when I'm looking through bull catalogs, um, there seems to be less emphasis on, you know, this guy gained four and a half pounds a day, for example, uh, rather than we will have his weight or his yearling weight put in there. That'll give you some idea that <clears throat> they fed him well. When you've got a, a yearling weight or a 12-month weight that's, you know, 13, 1,400 pounds on an Angus bull, then he's been a pretty well-fed bull, right? Um, yeah. So so you do know that. But I think that what I'm seeing out of that, and I try to, to kind of communicate that to my students, is, is that you kind of see a movement away from the actual – rate of gain to to you see the body size um, and that sort of thing. Now, one other thing that I like to point out and I'll share with you that I always say to students is this. Um, we've been harping on the, the, the problems with having overfed bulls for years with producers, right? And so also when that comes back to sperm morphology, overfed bulls, you know, um, too much fat in the scrotum, we end up with more morphological defects, et cetera, et cetera. And I always say to the students that we really push that and then we have a lot of uh, commercial buyers buying bulls and they really don't, they really get upset about really obese bulls. Uh, these bulls melt on them is kind of the industry language. They melt when they get out the pasture, they can't breed, um, they end up with problems with sperm defects. Bottom line, I always tell students though, is when you go to a bull sale, <clears throat> you you can teach producers all about this. And I said, you know, it's uh, no producer wants to buy a fat bull but tried to sell them a skinny bull. Yeah. And it's always tough. They'll always lean towards buying that bull that looks good. And, and you know, I often say that in Canada is when I look, it's the, the Canadians, um, you know, sometimes they'll um, maybe not as have much value on EPDs as I believe that they should, um, but they will, they'll, they love the visual appeal of a bull. Okay. So that kind of roundness, that fit, fitness. So I've kind of picked up on that a little bit. And, and what I do is I kind of talk about, yeah, it's great to have a great looking bull. Um, kind of go back to the things that we've just talked about already, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the parodies, the problems rather with, with feeding uh, too much. But come back to, I think a bull, whether it's a yearling or even a mature bull, should have the condition of uh, a well-trained athlete and the appearance of a well-trained athlete. And I really kind of stress that one. And I put that, I published that in Vet Clinics in North America the first time. I see it picked up here and there. And I really try to stress that. So rather than being fat, I like condition, okay? And and I think that I'm making some points uh, out there or making an impact and uh, people are picking up on that, Brad, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I think that's a great point. And, and the challenge is it's relative, right? Because no, nobody likes to buy that skinny bull, but the well-conditioned bull next to a, standing next to a bull that's a little bit fatter, it's he looks a little bit different than if you just looked at him by himself, right? All that's of right. us are susceptible to that. So I think that's a great point because what we're trying to do is make sure that these bulls uh, are fertile and you're talking slow and steady wins the race and the race is actually evaluated with that breeding soundness exam. And that Uh breeding soundness exam has several components. You mentioned testicular size, scrotal circumference. Uh, We'll do a palpation. We'll check out the seminal vesicles. You talked about that as, as part of the process. And then overall, generally, is this bull ready to be athletic? Can he do all the things? But one of the big components of that exam is sperm motility and morphology. And I want to ask you, because I know you've done some work on kind of what are some of the drivers, what are we looking at on sperm sperm morphology first? And then what are some of the drivers that cause it to go bad? Yeah, that's a great one. So you mentioned motility and morphology. And so I'm going to kind of skip over motility right now. There's some uh, your minimum motility in the U.S. Uh, under the Society for Therio system is 30%. And now they encourage individual motility. Individual motility just lets you know that you've got, you've got sperm moving. It's a good first test on there. Um, very rare that bulls fail on motility alone. Your biggest reason for a bull failing a breeding soundness evaluation is going to be um, sperm morphology. And that's where we're going to focus in on. 
And so what we try to do there is we, we have a look at it, make sure the bowl is the minimum of 70%. That's, re, that's whether you're in Canada, it's, it's worldwide, 70%. We know that bowls that are below that, significantly below that, yeah, we have more open cows and more, more problems with f- fertility. So that's why we kind of want to focus in morphology is the big one. And certainly kind of coming back, Brad, we know a lot about various defects. Um, so when we start talking about these young bulls and developing them, um, what are the signs of a bull not? not fully mature yet, um, is a high incidence of proximal droplets, proximal cytoplasmic droplets. And what I really try to encourage is kind of education of, of both of veterinarians, first of all, and then they go on and educate their producers. But proximal droplets, um, really a sign of, you know, some problems happening in the epididymis, but also in the late spermiogenesis period, just before they're shed into the seminiferous tubules. Uh, what's happened there is uh, there's been some, some malfunction there so the droplet doesn't move down. One thing, the thing that's really quite, quite critical about proximal droplets, though, is, is that it's not only the, the, the sperm that have the proximal droplets that are in the ejaculate, it's the, also the other ones that are present at the same time. So the contemporaries of those sperm with the proximal droplets, lots of those have problems as well. Putting this another way, the proximal droplet should be a compensable defect in that uh, normal looking sperm compensate and can still fertilize. So if there's a billion sperm, there's 30%. Um, proximal droplets, there should still be a 700,000 sperm there to do the job. The problem with that is when there's 30% proximal droplets, for example, and especially in these young bulls, is that the rest of them seem to have a problem so that our conception rates are much lower than expected. And so this is, again, when we get into sperm morphology, I really like to teach students a lot more about prognosticating. So when do you expect that bull to get over that? And then understanding what each of the defects do. Right. So rather than just knowing, you know, 70 percent is our minimum, what does each of the defects do? So uh, I'll I'll kind of leave it there for more questions from you. You bet. So the proximal droplets, though, what you're saying is that the other sperm are affected because they were probably formed through some problem in spermatogenesis. And even though some of those others look normal, they don't function normal. That's exactly it, Brad. You nailed it. So if we think about that process and you talked about prognostication, you mentioned this is often what we see when we fail a young bull. We'll see proximal droplets. He has a fair number of proximal droplets. We've got some other defects we can talk about here in a second. But in that case, I've got, let's say, a yearling bull because often I want to test him because I got a bull sale coming up. So I'm testing him young. Uh, He's got a lot of proximal droplets. Uh, does, Does that tell me, A, I should move on, this bull's not going to make it, or B, he's probably going to be fine, or C, uh, I don't know (laughs) whether he's going to be good or not at this point. I just can't evaluate. He's too young. Which which of those options do you tend to say when you have a, a young bull? Well, you've nailed all of the above. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it now. So that's a very good question. Um, will most of those bulls get over it? Yes, eventually. When will they get over it? I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, yeah. so so you may be asking me as a producer, you might say, "Can I put that bull on my bull sale that's two weeks from now?" And I go, uh, "I don't know." And and you know, and it gets troublesome when it's probably his best bull in the bull sale. Potential that right. that bull is going as a herd sire for another purebred herd or going to bull stud. Let's say it's a typical March bull sale. That bull could be turned out as soon as April. You know, for for breeding. Um, you know, so you you're not going to hide your mistakes potentially. And those bulls come back to bite you on the butt. Now, what, what, um, so both the Western Canadian Association of Bovine Practitioners have an evaluation system, which is slightly different from the U.S. system that's uh, advocated by the Society for Theory, but very slightly different. In both systems, they have a classification called, uh, ours is called decision deferred, and um, yours is a deferred decision. <laughs> it's just reversed, uh, reversed around a deferred classification. That allows you as a veterinarian to put it down and you can write down proximal droplets there. It's a pubertal issue. Uh, tell the truth. Um, and then, then discuss it with the producer as to whether they put them in the bull sale or not. Now, what I'm going to tell you, because we have a lot of veterinarians in the audience and um, astute producers, and I might get myself a little bit of heat for this, um, but I'm very careful with decision deferred. Um, so being a purebred producer myself and I go to a, uh, a, a bull sale, and there's a potential herd sire for me to buy. Um, and let's say he's a 14-month-old Angus bull. So, you know, they've, we know that at 14 months, 
our data shows us that about 75% of those bulls should pass. Okay, and let's say he's decision deferred from proximal droplets. I look at that and I probably won't buy a decision deferred bull. Okay, so for me and a herd sire type of situation, so I'm raising purebreds. So he is displaying issues with puberty. Is he going to pass that on to his sons? Other information that I know is that we follow decision deferred bulls, Al Barth and I, uh, back in the early part of uh, this last decade. We followed them for a few years and we would find that um, we would decision defer them in April. We'd come back in June to test them. Um, so about 60% would pass. We still would have 40% of those decision defers that didn't pass. And again, they're delayed and they go on, on and on and on and on like that. So that's the part that might get me a little bit of trouble. What I do see though is, is that, um, you know, I've been kind of advocating that around Saskatchewan here in a bull sales. Um, a lot of the purebred people that I work with are very uh, quick to also provide a guarantee on that bull. If that bull doesn't pass or hasn't hit kind of that, that, that target for that buyer, they will replace that bull or give them the money back. So that's helped out a lot. And then we also, what we also see, Brad, is I don't see bull studs. They're doing the same thing that I would do. They're not chasing a bull that's a decision to burn yeah. <laughs> or big well, buyers. No, and, and I think you're, you're right because part of it is, we often think of this as a yes, no scenario, but yeah. it's really uh, yes, no, and then win. So the yeah. win is important. And if I need him to work r right now and he's going into the herd, which is often how we're buying bulls, right? I need him to work relatively soon after this point, uh, then that, that doesn't help me if it's, if it's deferred. So you talked about the proximal droplets in the young bulls. What kind of what kind of defects do you see? And maybe we just think about annual a herd sire who's still kind of in the prime of of life. Let's say he's between three and eight, and he's out there. And your BSE in those bulls. What kind of what would be kind of your more common defects? Them is it still proximal droplets or something else? The most common defect we see, Brad, is distal midpiece reflexes. By far, okay. okay. Most commonly seen in the Angus breed, um, we consider them. Um, uh, reflection of short-term stress, you know, so um, a stress period needs to be at least three to four days. And sometimes producers say, well, I took them on a truck ride for 24 hours. Is that enough? No, stress usually, usually in this part of the country, it's inclement weather is a big stressor. So, so snow, snowstorms, late spring snowstorms are a perfect example for us. Um, and what will happen there is, um, so three to four days of, of wind and bad weather, and then the snow melts off. And then Generally, you'll start to see distal midpiece reflexes about four days after the stress. So they take a bit of time to kind of move through the epididymis. Epididymal travel is nine to 11 days, right? So it takes a few days for them to kind of end up in the ejaculate. Um, not all bulls are expected the same, even within the same breed. So we could have, you know, 20 Angus bulls, for example, 50% of those show distal midpiece reflexes. Some of them might have, you know, 10 to 12% distal midpiece reflexes passable. Some of them will have 20 plus percent and some of them will have up to 50 percent distal midpiece reflexes. The stress seems to be, but we'll see it more commonly in the Angus. I don't want to pick on them. I think there is a tendency that's across the breed for them to be more susceptible to showing that with stress. The next thing you see after distal midpiece reflexes, is if you're stressed, particularly if your stress is a little bit more long-standing, uh, intense. And so another example I use for that is lameness. Um, you know, lameness is an interesting one. We you know, so the animal can't walk, okay? And you kind of think, you know, well, he doesn't look like he has a lot of pain, but it's amazing what that does to a spermiogram. So with your, the sperm pitcher, and it can hit them hard. And so with that, what you'll get with that kind of stress is you'll have um, DMRs and then proximal droplets and so on. And so something like a lameness, and again, you're gonna see lots of those in older bulls, maybe they haven't been addressed. You'll get a smattering of defects. So we have the DMR, we we'll get some proximal droplets, love uh, nuclear vacuoles, uh, coil principal pieces. Um, you have a few knob daggers, I'm just a smattering. So a bull that's kind of hit really hard with something like that, you know, I may see 20 to 30% normal sperm on that ejaculate, right? So he's been, something's hit. Other chronic diseases, um, uh, I give the students examples. One that I've seen is a bull comes in in, in, in tough condition. So he looks really skinny. Um, taking a look at the bull, noticing that he's salivating a lot, open up his mouth. And I've seen a bull that, that was, had been kicked in the face and broke his jaw. 
And so we can't eat very well. So again, you know, if they're not able to eat, uh, that's, that's quite a stressor and there's pain associated with that. So, so the, the young bulls, proximal droplets is a big one we're looking for. You also see kind of a full smattering of, of bad defects. Uh, and then, and then with the, uh, older bull, the injured bull, you can have, you know, just a variety of different things in there. Um, if you want, there's a couple of other things I, I should share that you do see. Yeah, I absolutely. And before you, before you do, I want to ask on a couple of those, like the distal midpiece reflex and some of the other defects you talked about in older bulls. When we discussed proximal droplets, we said, okay, the proximal droplets are there, but they're really an indicator that things are bad, right? Things are not working as normal. What about these distal midpiece ref reflex? Is that, is that only those cells that are affected that we can see or because of the way you described the pathogenesis, yeah. I'm kind of, man, maybe everything's bad. Yeah, that's a great question. If it's just distal midpiece reflexes, they're, they're compensable. Okay? okay. So they're compensated. And so what we often do, and, and this is really interesting because I've debated uh, over the last few years, whether, you know, you could decision defer a distal midpiece reflex bowl. We don't typically do that. Um, what we typically do is we recommend a retest. Um, and I'll give you a typical pasture scenario. Let's say we showed up at your place and, and we had one of these storms and you really wanted us to come out and test these bulls and I start seeing a lot of DMRs. The typical thing that Al Barth and I would do would be to reschedule in a few days so that we can look at these bulls in the best possible condition that they could be in. And that way we could, we could be assured that the distal midpiece reflexes were resolving. So we just kind of pack up and come back. And that's, that's the typical thing. And largely, I still kind of hold on to that going forward is that, you know, we got a lot of DMRs here. Um, you know, we, we got a problem here. Maybe we should you know, come back and retest it. And you'd only wait a few days. You wouldn't wait because you, you talked about the sperm and the epidemics, nine to 11 days. Nine to process. 11 days. Yeah. So, so a good one that works for us is, so DMRs, if it's just DMRs, they're going to resolve within a few days. So, so right. weeks, that's one of the ones where you could, could expect to turn around in as little as a week. Okay. Typically when you're rescheduling, you're, you know, you make it a little, give them a little more time, 10 days to two weeks type of thing. That would be, that would be the example of where you would have kind of a short kind of rescheduling. And that's, that's basically where it can work. You start to get into, in the springtime, you get into longer rescheduling, you know, three weeks out, that gets really problematic because we really have a, kind of a short window to get these bulls tested and, 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 and get them out, uh, get them ready for the breeding field. And of course, producers will be concerned about sourcing replacements. Yeah. So those DMRs, yes, that's, that's a big one that you see there. Um, and um, it is compensable. And, um, you know, I will also see, let's say um, we have a kind of another rule of thumb. If we have more than 25% uh, acrosome and tail defects, even so, if you had just 25% of those, the bull would be 75% normal, right? So he's above the 70. That should be a red flag for you. I always tell students that, you know, typically if you've got, you know, 25% acrosome and tail defects, you've got enough other defects to count, you know, detached heads or, or whatever to get you below 70%. Um, I'll tell you and I tell people in the industry, when you fail a bull, <clears throat> I don't want to see a bull failed at 68%. Um, I want to see it nice and clear cut. Flipping that around, Brad, if, if, if you came to me and you owned a bull and I tested him and he's got some detached heads and he's got, you know, 15% distal midpiece reflexes, we've had a recent storm and he's 68%. Um, I'm likely to, to just put a circle around that and I'm going to put uh, questionable. So in Canada, we have a questionable classification. And just go, you know, it doesn't really meet the standard today, but you own the bull. And I usually will put in comments, um, this bull should be fine in so many days. Retest if you have any questions about the bull. That's typically handle how I'll handle a bull that's owned. That's different than a bull that's going to a sale. Brad, I never used to tell students that there was a difference in how you approached a breeding soundness evaluation until about five years ago, where I went, you know, let's just be realistic. Um, when the guy already owns the bull, put down what's there. He just wants to know what's going to happen with this bull. But if you're selling a bull, really, if you're if you're doing your job as a veterinarian, you need to make sure that you're honest and, and straightforward there, and you put down the facts in there, so that so that there's the the, the middle ground, the middle person, uh, which is the breeder of the bull, can't then sell the bull and maybe you know eliminate some of the comments that you had there. Does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like the approach of 
situationally, the numbers may mean something different. Because if I've already got this bull, and, and we talked about kind of the when, just like those pubertal bulls or even these bulls, when I need to use him, how I need to use him impacts into my decision process, right? So if I've got um, a bull that I already own, it may be different than, would you buy this bull? Not necessarily, but I already did. So <laughs> here he is. We'll, we'll have to handle him there. Uh, you mentioned I want the, the stress. So you talked about three or four day period of stress. And you mentioned there in Canada, the cold stress part of it. What, what about the opposite side? And here in the U.S., a lot of times we'll deal with some of the heat components. Does that have the same effect? Do you expect the same type of defects or do you see something different with heat or is heat not as big a deal? Heat's a big deal. Heat and stress are your two biggest problems. You know, pro what I call insults to spermatogenesis. Heat and stress. Okay. okay. Other things that you have are genetics, toxins. Uh, season, um, and I might be forgetting one there, but you know, those are kind of minor type of nutritional. Okay, so we know with vitamin A deficiency. So those are about well, four other ones, but heat and stress are your key ones. And you know, for years, until actually I, I recently published a paper on testicular degeneration with Jen Kozio out of Texas Tech University, and Jen and I have been friends for years, and we did quite a literature search on, you know, uh, testicular degeneration and, and uh, you know, studies to look at it and insults to spermatogenesis. Prior to that, you know, in Canada, we talked about heat, and, and Al Barth had done some stuff where they put on scrotal sacs onto the bulls to, to, for four days to kind of raise the temperature of the testicles. Because we know that the bull testicles function at three and a half to four degrees, kind of below the typical body temperature, right? Dick Saki had also done that work. We looked at the defects. So to kind of answer your first question, was there a difference really between uh, a stress? So in, in that study, they used dexamethasone corticosteroid to kind of to induce the stress situation and then they use this scrotal sacs and really the there was really no difference in in the defects i showed the students the other day there were four bowls in each group um one bowl that had scrotal insulation i think did not show any knobbed acrosomes but the by and large most of them they showed distal page reflexes they showed proximal droplets they all showed it at pretty well the same time after the insult and so really when when you're looking at sperm function or spermatogenesis, there's no way to speed up um, the production of sperm. So it takes 61 days or so in the bull's testicles plus um, 9 to 11 days of uh, epididymal transit time to make that sperm. You can't speed up or slow down, but the insults that come along, typically they'll affect the most the sperm at most at risk, which are the ones just about to be released into the seminiferous tubules. That's the last 18 days or so. That's spermiogenesis. And so kind of coming back to what I said with heat and stress, both of them seem to affect them the same. So so that they'll show up at the same time, they'll do whatever. To kind of help me understand that, you know, I, I, I stared at that, the information on that for years. You know, what does what does heat do? You know, heat heat. Um, so when you increase the temperature in there, the that increases the metabolic demand of the cells. In case of the Sertoli cells that are functioning and so on, the Sertoli cells are supporting the the the, the, the development of the, the spermatocytes and spermatids and, and so on and so forth. Uh, they're helping all that. So the, the metabolic demands are increased. They can't be met because there's not enough oxygen there, and we get into a hypoxic state. And we used to leave it there, and, I, and then I kind of dug a little bit deeper when I was looking at testicular degeneration. What does a hypoxic state do? to a Sertoli cell. Well, Sertoli cells are responsible for concentrating testosterone and making testosterone available uh, for, you know, the sperm production. It's a great, it's a great regulator hormone. On the other side, when you stress them and, and use corticosteroids, corticosteroids, they affect both the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and they decrease FSH and LH, okay, which then in turn decreases testosterone. So, Brad, what I'm coming back to is both of them, if you complete the pathways, come back to the hormone testosterone. Okay, so, so, and that's kind of how it helps me understand the heat and stress are essentially going to do the same two things. Now, if I could expand a little bit more on the heat. So, Jennifer and I did this work, and one of the things that really became clear to me is that um, the Americans knew a lot more about testicular degeneration than we did. They experienced a lot more, particularly in southern regions, right? So they yeah. idiopathic testicular degeneration. A lot of it came back to heat, summertime heat. Um, and, and then I really started to dig heat. You know, this is why people in the, in, the, in the deep south, they don't typically breed cattle during the summertime, right? 
or, you know, and, and it gets harder to, to get cows pregnant, you know, dairy cows pregnant during that time. Um, the heat is incredible what it does. Um, and heat, I think, particularly when you're with phosphorus cattle in those hot and humid regions, um, I think it's, it's worse than, than what we deal with with cold. Yeah, and I think the heat, the other confounding factor in, in some regions of the country, you have additive factors like endophyte in some of the grasses, uh, yes. some of the other that allows us to, that causes some peripheral vasoconstriction, which doesn't help any of the stuff you're talking about. <laughs> does not, does not. It does not. So, so when working on this paper, it's like, you know, uh, I got 20 years on Jennifer and I thought I had, you know, lots more experience with testicular degeneration. And I started digging in. It's like, no, you, she's in Texas, Oklahoma is where she's raised. And it's like, oh no, you guys see a lot more testicular de degeneration and see heat related. We think about scrotal uh, inflammation and, and traumas and orchitis. Yeah. And, and I think it's uh, that testicular degeneration. Is there any way to a mitigate it minimize the problem or b fix it once we've identified it Aha, that's a great question um so we know the things that can cause it so certainly certainly talking about heat and and so on is to kind of mitigate heat right by like cooling making sure there's cooling things there um lots of times the ones that are due to a severe insult to spermatogenesis most of the time we see those after the fact and there's not a lot you know you might say, well, making sure that cattle don't get lame. Lameness, you know, could result in that. Um, obesity is a big one because coming back to these overfit bulls, um, obesity was a big one in this part of the world. So the more northern regions, fat bulls lay down fat in the scrotum. Um, <clears throat> bulls lay down fat in different ways in there, but fat affects thermal regulation. And so that was a big one. So uh, helping producers kind of manage, you know, don't get those bulls too fat because it kind of causes te te testicular degeneration. Um, and then it's also, I've been able to kind of impact kind of the show circuit because I had, a, I've had a few bulls. Um, one most notable one was a horned Hereford bull sold it kind of a famous bull sale here in Canada. A lot of money paid for him went, went to another part of the country and, uh, you know, wasn't settling cows and, you know, was looked at, uh, both with his serving capacity and then his testicles. And the comment was, you know, his, his testicles have gone from a scrotal circumference of 38 centimeters to 32, which is quite a dramatic drop. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so you're looking at degeneration. But um, another point I really need to make to you is that re degeneration isn't always permanent. Okay, so they can recover from it. It just takes time. And the trouble with the high dollar bulls is um, sometimes producers get really ticked off when they, they want to capitalize on their investment. And then and sometimes they're looking at a couple of years before they can get kind of back and, and using that bull. So they get really, really frustrated. And I get involved in, in sometimes with insurance companies and so on as how do they need to be compensated for their loss, right? Um, so that's that's kind of that side there. But yeah, degeneration is a is a real pain. Um, you know, kind of doing things to make sure that you don't um, have an insult to spermatogenesis that goes so far as to uh, um, cause degeneration is is important if you can do that. This is this has been great learning about bulls from you. I need to come spend some time with you because I think I think just a lot of information and all of it so absolutely critical to going through. And it's more than just a BSE. So you talked about not just the classification status of that bull at the end, but kind of the win and the use case. And I like incorporating both of those into my decision process because that helps me as a, as a producer or a veterinarian make the right decision for that situation. It's time for our famous three. We have a time and labor saving product for you. Beef and Dairy AgriSlat by Healthy Farms is your solution. No more lugging jugs around the barn every month. With Beef and Dairy AgriSlat, you simply drop the slat through the floor twice a year and it works to break down solids, reduces crusting and forming. To learn more, visit MyHealthyFarms.com. Now I'm going to switch gears, Colin. I've got some other questions I want to ask you here as, as we come to the end is, I want to ask you, what is your favorite uh, beef related resource. So when you're going to go learn something else, is it a conference, a book, a podcast, a website? Where do you go learn more about the beef industry in your interest area? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I have a variety of different things. You know, um, uh, I like drovers. 
right? So you get the, the, the information there. Here in Saskatchewan, we have uh, the stock growers. Okay, so that's one of our cattle groups. Every Friday, they send out kind of a newsletter. And in there, they will have, they'll cruise through drovers and whatever else. And they'll sort of have some highlights on the industry, uh, what's happening oh, pretty much all over North America, if not the world. So I'll pick up on that and I'll read that. Um, if you talk to my wife, I'm a big YouTuber. Um, yeah. That's pretty much the only channel that I watch, and uh, you might chuckle at that because I've had I've had colleagues before in in science say, "Did you learn anything from that?" And I actually watch a lot of producer or um, you know shows. Um, and I'm not saying this because we probably have producers in the audience, but I learn a ton from producers. Yeah. And I learn a lot in these these videos, kind of how they do things. Sometimes you see how not to, but I pro I'm a producer myself, and so you kind of you see how they did things. And then I learned a lot from 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 older producers around me because I came from a different part of the country about kind of how to how to survive and how to kind of do things in this part of the country. And so you kind of see that, and and I and I and I watch that. So that's one of my favorites. That's entertaining is to watch these YouTube videos, and I've got a number of them that I do. And and uh, Sometimes I'll do a search. There was one kind of uh, the American rancher, you know, and so they would kind of go around and look at different ranching outfits. Um, I've got another one, too, is uh, very recently I had a, a client that we would test some bulls for that would do a lot of genetic testing and he was feeding his cattle through. He's a very, very kind individual. I reached out to him the other day because um, I knew they were making some transitions in their operation. He changed partners and and so on and so forth. And uh, I said, you know, I'm really interested in working with you again. And he said, I'm interested in working with you. And I said, I learned a ton from you. I said, we should just get together and have a cup of coffee and kind of talk about what you're doing and your kind of your breeding programs and so on. And he goes, I'd love that because he says, I need some help with, you know, some fixed time artificial insemination programs and, and testing the bulls. And, and so you'll get a kick of this. And I said, well, how many cows are you running now? Because you guys were seven or 800 before. And he says, well, no, with the new um, operation, we're 1,200. Um, we, we plan to go stepwise to 2,000 and then 4,000 cows. And so, and I said, wow. And so then, so here's, here's a good one for you. I started talking about the challenges of finding staff to help out with that. And so in my own operation, I couldn't find decent staff. Um, so I decided to raise them. And so I have yeah. my own children working there. And then, then they're going to head off into other careers. So I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, you know, we're we're kind of focusing on a group. Uh, it's it's um, a group of Mennonites that have come from uh, Eastern Canada. But he says, you know, we're finding if it's people from small operations um, that uh, have a little bit of cow sense, whether that's dairy cows or raising some heifer calves. He goes, that's a good first place to start is having that cow sense. So I really digress there, Pitt, but but I really get information from a lot of sources, and maybe not, you know, I just don't sit down and read textbooks or read. Uh, scientific papers. I, I do look at those, but I really like to kind of look at the practical stuff and, and get that information. I think that's great. And and I like your inclusion of people, producers going to others for resources. What about non-beef information? So just favorite, favorite maybe book that you that you've read that's not related to beef or ag? <laughs> um, I like a lot of business um, type of books, you know, like personal growth books, if you will. Right, personal business growth books, um, leadership books. Um, kind of gone through some stuff where uh, I actually, you know, I'll share this because um, I'm a big fan. I uh, I had a career coach that I worked with about a year ago. Um, really, really helped me. So then from that, I would do a lot of reading, kind of about kind of how you approach meetings and how you communicate with other people, um, and really found that helpful to help me kind of focus in on my career and kind of. You know, um, I think we all, society evolves. That's kind of one of the things that I like to share with people is that we all evolve. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, what you and I might have found humorous is really not humorous today. Um, and I went through, you know, being in my 50s, I kind of went through a point, well, gee, the, the younger crowd today have no sense of humor. Well, I've come to really kind of accept that is that society changes. And some of those things that, for example, we thought were funny 20, 30 years ago, really they're insensitive um, and and so on. And, and uh, you know, if I do find a little bit of humor in something, I make sure I kind of share it with a small group um, and, and not not further. So, so again, for me, you know, personal growth type of books and communication books have been most helpful for my career. Um, and really, I've, I've actually taken it, like I said, I'm a cattle producer and I really kind of take that forward uh, in my communications with my colleagues. Some of my favorite people in the world are my fellow cattle producers. I really 
truly do enjoy the industry um, and enjoy taking what I've learned about communication and making sure I put it into practice with them. And, and I'll give you a really good example. It's important as a veterinarian and it's important, I think, as a, as a human being. I never have anything negative to say about others in those groups. Yeah. And that's that's kind of a big takeaway. And I found that that to be a, a really good, it's really bolstered me, I think, in terms of, of, of my reputation that I have with my colleagues. That's excellent. And uh, more rare than it should be, because you're exactly right. Yeah. If we can avoid being negative, it makes a big difference. It sure Last, does. I'll ask you, and you may have already kind of touched on this, but what, what are maybe one or two characteristics you see when you see somebody and say, man, that person is successful in the beef industry. What are, what are one or two characteristics you see of that person? What I like to what I see there, and, and I do study that because, uh, you know, I'm striving to, to, to be there myself is, is a willingness to learn new things, right? It's a willingness to learn new things and having an open mind. You know, other things that I see is, um, um, kind of a more basic thing is, uh, is having a having a pretty good land base in this part of the country. So I've kind of got a good rule of thumb is a good a, a, a land base and um, a good bit of equity in it. Yeah. Okay. So and and really for myself is I, I've gone through an expansion phase. You know, kind of starting here and and buying land and so on. And of course our interest rates have gone up. And you know we've had these ups and downs in the industry. And it's really in my readings. You know, so my business readings and my interactions with bankers and stuff. I'm I've really convinced myself of to. Uh, where I'm at in life is to lower the amount of debt that I have, pay off as much as I can, prove my equity situation there. And then that really helps me to kind of ride through some of these storms that are happening. So that's kind of kind of a key practical thing. And just that willingness to have an open mind and learn and learn from others is, is uh, I think, is really important. Absolutely. Well, Colin, I've greatly enjoyed this conversation, and I'm sure our listeners will as well. Thanks again for joining us on the Beef Podcast. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. I'd, I'd do it again in a heartbeat.